All right, well, let's pray and uh, we'll get started tonight. Father, I thank you tonight again that we get to be back in your house, that we get the opportunity to study your word. I thank you, Father, that we can call upon you. We can ask you, Lord, to give us the miracle of understanding. And Father, this is something you enjoy doing. You want us to be able to read and to study and to understand and to apply your word to our lives. That's because you're a good father. And you love us so much. So thank you for that. Father, I pray tonight as we do our study that you again will just uh, help us to see if this applies to us tonight. Uh, Lord, there may be some here tonight that has this guilt, but Lord, as we go through the study, I pray that you just give us a clear example of what to look for tonight, Father. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> All right. So tonight we're going to talk about discernment. Um, it's, it's interesting the way the author of this study uh, said he, he classified this along with the serving gifts. And I, I say it's interesting because the reason he said that they are classified as serving gifts is because they're obviously not speaking or sign gifts. So this is kind of a special category that he just didn't have another category to put it in, so we're calling it serving. And really, the truth is, uh, the, the gift of discernment is uh, something that we can use to serve the church. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, the gift of discernment um, it is important because, let's think about this for just a moment. Paul, when he's talking about, in Ephesians, when he's talking about putting on the armor of God, he surrounds this idea of putting on the full armor of God with the truth that I think, uh, it, who has Ephesians 6, 12 that you can read just real quick? Uh, I got it. Does somebody, somebody have it? Yeah, I do. Okay. Would you read that out? The, just verse 12. Okay. Um, let's see. For our battle, yes. Mm -hmm. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. Okay. So the reason that this gift is so important to the church is because one of the things that, that Jesus said about the church is that he would build the church. But he said one more thing about the church. You might remember what that was. I will build the church and what? The powers of hell will not prevail against it. Which tells me that this church, the church, not just this building, but the church as a whole, is under assault. From where? Spiritual powers and rule, right? So what this, uh, this, this discernment is all about in really the key to this, this is recognizing these spiritual forces and the difference between the spiritual forces that God sends to protect us. And there are angelic beings that, that are in the spiritual world. Uh, the Holy Spirit is obviously spirit. God is a spirit. And this is the, his, his power, his presence in the world is spiritual in nature. But he's not the only spiritual force in the world. There are also the negative, the demonic forces, Satan and his horde, that are also in the world. This idea of discernment talk is recognizing the difference between the two. And you would think this would be a really simple thing, right? I mean, you know if something looks evil to you that that's evil, right? It's not always the case, though, is it? Sometimes God allows things to happen in our lives that are not what we desire. And those things we call evil. <laughs> maybe incorrectly. Um, also, there are some things that maybe Satan brings into our lives that we would just automatically recognize this is, all, this is horrible, this is a bad thing, this is evil. But that's not always the case either. Um, matter of fact, in 2 Corinthians 11, uh, verse 14, it says, For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Meaning that Satan can sometimes look like one of God's forces to our eyes. And it takes something, it takes discernment 
to be able to recognize when that's the case versus God's army. So that's, the, that's sort of the focus of what this lesson is all about, is being able to, not just being able to recognize this, but the people that have this gift of discernment, what it is that they can do within the church and why it is that they're important to the church and why it is that maybe we should not look at them and think, man, that person, that's just crazy what they say. <laughs> We need to pay a little bit of attention. So the truth is that if you read through a large part of the Pauline gospel or, or Pauline writings, what he writes a lot about is false doctrine and false teachers. And the reality is we need to be careful uh, and pay very close attention to what's being taught, not just in our church, but what comes through our radio, what comes through our TV, what books we pick up to read. Does anybody believe that there are false teachers that are active today? Anybody believe that they're not or that, that that's just a fake, that's something that ended back when Paul was maybe just a little over, uh, you know. It, this is something that happened and is here today, every day. I can, you know, you turn on the radio and you hear, um, you know, you hear teachings or hear about teachings that are false. And it takes a lot of effort, a lot of times, to be able to recognize the difference between a teacher that is godly, the teaching that's godly, and the teaching that's not. And I'm going to submit a little piece of evidence that it's not so easy to tell the difference between what God says and what Satan says changes into something different. Here's my example. Everybody remembers back in the Garden of Eden, God said to Adam, do not eat of this fruit or else what? You're going to die. So let's remember that. And then Satan comes along talking to Eve and says, what was it that God said? What did Eve do? She said, he said, don't eat of this tree or what? Or, or even touch. touch it. Now, wait a minute. There is the first false teaching in Scripture. Because what she did was took what God said, which is true, and she changed it to fit the situation. Because she felt like, perhaps, that by adding this little bit to it, it made it a little bit stronger. She improved upon what God said. Now, we all know the result of that in the end, but what Satan did is he said, God didn't say you, you're not going to really die. And let's think about this for just a moment and think about how solid what Satan said to Eve became in her mind just shortly after it occurred. So she took partook of the fruit. Did she fall over and die? No, not right away. Death did come into the world as a result of that act, but she didn't fall over and die. So here's the way these false teachings, and the reason why this is so difficult perhaps for us to recognize is because it is so subtle, the difference between what God said and what Satan said to Eve, and then what looked like perhaps could be true, I didn't really die, Happened, and now it's a solid false teaching. It's solidified now in Eve's mind. <clears throat> this is how subtle and how careful we have to be concerning false teachers. We have to really and truly be on our guard. And God gives us, in the church, a group of people who have the ability to help us with that recognition. That's what discernment is all about. Let's back up. One step. I know where you're going. I'm not going to stop you. No, no, go. Which <clears throat> says it's it's hard because of how subtle the change is. Hard to recognize, but not impossible. Correct. How do we recognize this? How do we pick up on those subtle trees, so to speak? Come on. We got another scripture, we got another scripture. <laughs> and that's where we run. That's where so many people run into problems. Is well. They said it, it must be true. Just like if it's on Facebook, it must be true, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the same thing. 
And, and that's how come so many people are led astray by false teachers that we do have today. How? Because they'll take a verse. And you want to know if they're false or not? Line up with, take what they're saying and line it up with the Word of God. Guess what? If it's not lining up, they're false. I mean, it's just that that part simple. But hard, yes. Impossible, no. But you're going to have to spend time in God's Word so you know what the truth is and what their error is. Okay? So I didn't want you to back up and say, well, it's impossible for me to know if they're telling the truth. No, it's not. It's in here. It's very, it's, it's clearly printed there. You just got to spend time studying it. So. Well, kind of like in the, the Eve example that he was talking about, it's um, like a professor that I had in seminary said it was um, in a debate, whoever you let define the terms will usually be the one that ends up winning the debate. And so we have to be very careful nowadays because people will use words and it'll sound good within the phrase and within the structure. But if you listen to the, the subtlety of what they're saying, you know, they avoid telling a blatant out and out lie because we're just going to skirt around the edge with the words we choose to use. And, and it's, I, he's yeah, right. It is, that, it is very difficult to pick it up, but it's not impossible. Yeah. <laughs> a, a good example, and not to get on a political thing or at all, but you notice whenever they were talking about like, the election sort of thing and you know now they're all in the media calling it a big lie sort of thing but did you notice every time someone tried to deny any sort of things or misgivings or things going on they would say there's no evidence of widespread election fraud and it was like subtlety right there widespread election fraud. Well, no, no, there is not some huge evidence of one massive thing that they're doing across the board, across the nation to do it. But yeah, there's small <coughs> little pockets of little things that were popping up. And so right. it's it's just little subtleties in how folks choose to use language. Oh yeah. Uh, well, and, and sometimes it's a little more, so, it, well, well, we'll get to, cause we'll come back, not to that, but we're gonna come back to this concept here shortly because the, the word that is translated here as discerning, uh, it says in the book, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 10 says, uh, has uh, specifically is where you find this listed. Uh, in uh, the ERB, it says distinguish between spirits. That's what they call the discernment is another word that's used. I believe King James Version translates it as discernment. Uh, ESV translated as distinguishing between spirits, and you'll find... Uh, NIV has a different translation as well. There's several different uh, meanings to this word, but it's the where word, we get a word antiseptic from, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was interesting. <laughs> well, so so this word that's translated that really uh, really means to dis discern or to judge. It means to discriminate. Um, so the word actually, I when I saw this, I thought, well, it, I'm going to look at this word in some of the word study books that I have and some of the, the texts that I have. And I thought it was interesting because the word diakresis is, is the Greek word. And it really, the direct translation is diakresis means the act of judgment. That is making a judgment call. But truthfully, the, thing, the word itself has some interesting properties. Uh, if you look at it, it comes from a word called diakrino. Uh, dia in the Greek language is a prefix that basically means thoroughly, extra. Um, but it has this 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 flavor of back and forth. That is to judge or to, you know to move between this and this and make comparisons. That's what this prefix really does. And by doing that, it adds to the meaning of the word crisis or crino, which means to judge. So what, what the word diacrino, diacresis, what it really means is judging between two things. But it's more than that, it's between two things that you really understand both sides of the picture. Well, in other words, as you were saying that, I was thinking diameter. It's to oh, it's, it's, yeah, it's looking at the whole picture. <laughs> it's, 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 that's, that's really what it's talking about. To be able to look at the whole picture, but it's instant 
being able to recognize both pieces, all sides to this discussion, to this thing that we're making this judgment upon. Is it godly in nature? Is it not godly in nature? And being able to make that judgment call between those two is really what this word talks about. The word pre, which is the uh, uh, the, the root word of priestess, really means separation. So it's to pull out, to separate the things so that you can look at them and, it, and examine them carefully. That's really what this word means. Discernment is about looking at a situation, looking at a circumstance, looking at a person who's speaking to you, looking at... Uh, maybe a teaching that you're hearing and being able to determine, is that thing coming from God? Is this person telling me the truth? Is this person recognizing or, or is what they're saying really the, what's happening? That's what this gift of discernment is all about. Now, there's some biblical examples. Which should, let me, let me go to go. Before we can go. Which, let me ask you this. By listening to what Butch just said, this thorough definition of what the word means, can you see a negative aspect of this gift right away? It should just jump right out there at you. <clears throat> if, if, if you have the ability or you are supposed to be completely tearing apart and examining something thoroughly, like he said, immediately bringing it up, people will call you what? Judgmental or critical. That's why Paul, later on, he kept reminding these churches that you need to use this gift because people are reluctant to use this gift because people accuse them of being judgmental or having a critical spirit. So you can see where this is. This is kind of a tough one. If you have it, you don't necessarily... I mean, you're sitting in church and... If you're sitting in, in, a, in a worship service and you hear the preacher and he's like, wait a minute, that's not going with what I'm reading. You don't necessarily want to stand. Hey, wait, 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 brother. You, you said that all wrong. You're a false prophet. You're not going to do that. Well, some of them might. <laughs> <laughs> Just think I'm not a false prophet. But you can see where this gift is, is hard to, it's, it's people are difficult to manifest this gift, but it's so important. Uh, in doing so. So I just think it's always interesting. Paul's like, you need to use this skill. You need to use this skill. And they're not using it. It's very it's important. I think a lot of it sounds like in medical science. For a long time, we didn't advance in medical science and Western thought because we were afraid to actually dissect yeah. and study the body internally, you know, mm -hmm. to see what was going on. And it's the same way with this, is, you know we can stay in kind of a spiritual haze or fog because we won't rightly divide things with the Word of God. Mm -hmm. so, so let's think about this, uh, this gift in action um, and the absence of this gift, what kind of damage it could do to the church. Um, the example that they give in the book here is uh, uh, probably one of the more common examples that I see talking about this gift of discernment. Uh, is uh, the, the story of Ananias and Sapphira when they sell some property. Well, they sell some property, and Ananias comes to Peter and says, here you go, here's all the money I got from the sale of my property. And Peter says, no, no, it's not. See, that's Peter's, that's the gift of discernment in Peter to recognize the lie. Now, notice what he said, what Peter said to Ananias specifically. In Acts 5.3, he said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? Now, it's important to, I'm going to make a, just a real quick note here. If you read the rest of this, this act, this chapter in Acts, or the rest of this little uh, incident in Acts, you'll find out that, that Peter said, it's not that you didn't give it all. That's not the problem. The problem is you lied about it. Okay, so I, but the the piece that we're that we're talking about here is Peter's recognition of the truth and the fact that what Ananias was saying was not true. Now, here's the problem with that: this, if somebody lies to you and you find out that they told you a lie, what is true about your relationship with them moving forward? It's hard to trust them, right? Now, imagine that you are 
a fledgling group of Christians in a relatively small number in a big empire whose goal is not to crush this little church, but to make sure that everybody in the empire worships at least periodically the Caesar, the guy that's in charge of this big empire, and you're a little church that says, we don't worship anybody but Christ. Now, this is the gathering, this is the group of people, and what would have to be true if you're going to go and visit this group of people and worship with them, and you can't trust the people that are there because they're telling lies? How important is it that Peter used his gift of discernment to ferret out this lie within this small church? Very important, right? I mean, wouldn't you agree? And it's not just because Ananias is no longer part of the community. Well, he, he was buried, but he's no longer part of, the, of, of this group of believers. And so this distrust was not allowed to take root in this gathering. If it had, that would have been damaging and possibly devastating to this small church. So that's one example of, of how important this gift is to the community of believers. Jeff, we talked about some other examples too. Yeah, well, Peter's gift of discernment is brought up multiple times in the New Testament. Actually, one of the other things that someone with this gift has to watch out for is speaking a little too quickly in this. Remember when uh, Peter recognized Jesus as the Messiah? And what did Jesus tell him? He said, flesh and blood and told you this is from God. That is clearly calling out his gift of discernment. But then, just a little bit later, what happens? I don't even know that guy. <laughs> yeah, he, he's like, you remember when Jesus says, wait, you know, get behind me, Satan, because he recognizes that Peter then had turned right around and spoken out of context because, you know, he just he blows it out. You remember when Simon, the uh, sorcerer, tried to buy the gifts that the apostles had there in Acts? Peter clearly called him out on that one, too. So his gift is, is very evident. But let's look at an Old Testament example. A lot of people think that the gifts... Well, that's a New Testament thing. There weren't any spiritual gifts in the Old Testament. Can you think of an Old Testament person that could have had the gift of discernment? How about someone that specifically asked for it? I'll make it easy for you. Solomon, Solomon did. God says, what, what do you, whatever you want, he asked for discernment so that he could govern properly. And we know this pleased God. He got everything else to do. Did it ever materialize under Solomon's reign? One of the coolest stories in to me in the Old Testament. Remember when the two ladies had the one baby? Yeah, how did he discern it? I know a lot of people think, well, that was just, he was just lucky. No, that was this gift of discernment. He knew exactly what was going on. So it materialized itself there. So there are Old Testament and New Testament, to me, gifts of discernment. Before we, yeah, I think that was <laughs> Yeah. Before it, 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 we're going to talk a few minutes about it, about another sort of aspect to this gift as well. Um, uh, Jesus displayed this gift as well, and we talk about you know all of these gifts that we talk about are at least in some degree in each one of us, uh, and in in specific a large this is sort of a big part of the personality of those who are specifically gifted with these particular gifts. But Christ displayed all of these gifts in his life. He is, after all, God, and God is the one giving these gifts, therefore he must have them. And so an example uh, that we have in Scripture of this is his recognition of exactly who Judas was, Judas Iscariot, prior to Judas actually going through with the things that he did. Um, in John chapter 13, I don't know if I wrote that one on here, um, in John chapter 13, uh, Judas was pretty well trusted by the disciples, at least to some degree, because what was Judas within the group? Right. He was the treasurer. He held the money. Pretty important position, and you got to kind of trust the guy that just did this. However, Jesus recognized and knew who Judas was from the very beginning. John chapter 6, 64 says this, but there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew, and this is the parenthetical quote, for Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. Jesus knew this in advance that Judas would do this particular act. 
He knew that would be the case. And so this is part of, this is an example of the discernment that happened in Jesus' life. He recognizes uh, that, that Judas was who he was way uh, before he ever did anything to sort of indicate that that's what he was going to be. Um, so we kind of touched on this a little bit. Um, uh, it talks in here in the book about a believer with the gift of discernment can quickly detect false teaching or preaching as something that we have to recognize. Now, I want to point out something here, and Jeff kind of touched on this too, but in order to recognize something that's false, you have to know what? The truth. The truth. Okay, now this is true whether you have this gift of discernment or not. You have to be uh, engaged in study of God's word because it doesn't matter who you are. If you're a Christian, then you need to be buried, burying yourself in God's word and reading it and understanding it. That's true no matter what your gifts are. Um, but a person who has this gift, uh, it, they call it in here a spiritual counterfeit detector. This is someone who has the ability to see the truth and see when somebody's telling, not telling the truth. The problem, though, is that even though the gift itself is perfect because it comes from a perfect God, it is given to people who are not perfect. And so the, in, in execution of this gift, sometimes uh, one problem uh, that people with this gift, it says they tend to become heresy hunters. That's the word uh, that, that's, that's listed, that, or that's the word that they use here. In other words, they have a tendency perhaps to... Uh, if they are not centered and their life is not centered in Christ the way it's supposed to be, they may have a tendency to move on towards, like Jeff said, being the one who every single thing you say, well, that's not entirely true. Well, you know, you got to give people a break. We're all imperfect. We all say things. Now, it's different if I'm saying, you know what, this scripture really means this thing and it kind of means something else that really it doesn't mean. That's what they're supposed to be detecting. But it's not just because... I mean, I may say that, that, you know what, Jesus lived a perfect life. But if I don't also say Jesus lived a perfect life and then died and then rose again, that doesn't mean that I'm telling an incomplete truth. And that's what this, this that's what he's referring to here. Uh, they have a tendency to become heresy hunters because they're looking for things that you say that aren't exactly right. This is something that, that is sort of a danger to watch out for if you have this gift. Um, it's also difficult, um, and I can tell you from a, now this gift manifests itself in my life in, in a little left. I'm, this is not my primary gifting, but it is something that I do have uh, some some level of uh, gifting in. Um, and I find this next sentence to be sort of it applies to me a lot more than it should. Uh, but they have a difficult time benefiting from sound biblical teaching. Because even when I disagree with one little part of it, it's hard for me to let that thing go and take the rest of it. So it, it, it becomes very, it, that's, that's a danger. That's, that's, that's a sinful action that we, that we, if you have this gift, you've got to be very careful and monitor this. Because we are told in Scripture that we're supposed to be in church, and not everybody that's in church is going to be the one preaching or teaching. So if I'm not in there preaching or teaching, I'm supposed to be doing what? Hearing from God in that place. And if I don't hear from God's messenger, then I'm not going to hear from God. And if I don't hear from God while I'm in his church, that's a sin. So this is something that we have to be very careful about if you have this particular gift. Um, now, in First John, John says that we are to do what? Test the spirit. This is talking to everybody. So all of us, to some degree, have this discernment, this ability to, to discern between truth and what's not true. And, if, you know, if you're a Christian, the more you grow like Christ, and this is something that I, I thought about today. I don't know if I've ever put this into these terms or thought about it in this way, but here's the reality. We've talked about several times when we give examples in each of these gifts. Who is it that has all of these gifts in perfect supply? Jesus. Jesus does. And if our Holy Spirit that lives within us, if his job, if you will, is to sanctify us, that is to purify us and move us closer to look like who? Jesus. 
That must mean that one thing that he does in our lives is to take, we're going to start to have a greater degree, not because he's gifting us with these things, but we're going to have a better ability to discern the truth from a lie, right? Because we're looking more like Christ. We're going to have the greater degree of the ability to serve others. We're going to have a greater degree of ability to be a helper within the church and all of these different things. That doesn't mean that we're all going to be a preacher, but what it does mean is that we're all going to be able to look more like Christ <coughs> in our lives. And as we do that, we're going to be able to more effectively test the spirits and recognize the difference between what's true and what's not true, right? So here's what God says, or what the, what the, the way they close this part of the lesson out. They say God wants all believers to have the gift of discernment to some degree. Why? Because he wants everybody to look like his son, because that's what we're called to do. And that's why he gave us the Bible. That's the way that's what he put here. And I think this is so important and so key um, that, you know, this is true, that he does want all of us to, to have some, some level of this gift of discernment. But for those that don't have the fullness of this gift, that is, those who aren't able to recognize these things, you know, in a little more immediate way, how is it that we can properly discern when something is true or not? Jeff already talked about it. Know you about we it. have the source of all truth right here in front of us. And if we, if we know what's in here, then when we hear something that's not true, we have the ability then to be able to understand, hey, that's, this is how we test the spirits, is everything that we see, everything that we hear, should be filtered through the lens of God's word, right? That's, what, that's the way we should act. That's the way we should view the world is through the same lens. Now, I'm not going to mention names. <laughs> I have before. <laughs> but I'm not going to mention names today. But there are a great many preachers that live in some large cities in the United States that <laughs> yeah, not, not 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 out, yeah. Delhi is not a big enough city. Yeah, out. But there are some preachers who, who, who live not just in, uh, because of their false teaching, but their false teaching really is cult-like in the sense that it draws people. Why does it draw people? Why? I'm not going to mention names. Why, why do some of these preachers draw so many people, and why are so many people faithful to the preacher? Ah, because that guy is saying something that they want to hear. It makes them feel better about themselves. Now, I'm going to give you an example of why or one way that we can use God's Word or think about how God's Word talks about different things that may make you understand how you can use this to help you discern which ones of those people that you may or may not see on TV or you may or may not read their books or you may or may not hear on the radio, how you can discern when they're telling the truth versus when they're not. Here's the thing. When you read God's Word and you really pay attention to what it says, does it make you feel good? Not always. Why? Because what's in God's Word? The truth. And what is the truth about us? Romans 3, for all have sinned. And guess who that includes? That includes me. When I compare myself to God's word, I fall short every single time. Now, there are some comforts in here. That's not to say that every time you read God's word, you feel bad. Because there's a lot of comfort that comes from your relationship with God. But when somebody is telling you something that the Bible is saying that you are something special, if that's the way they, not necessarily the words they use, but if that's the truth that they're teaching, listen, we are not anything special, except to this extent. When Christ came to the earth, he knew from eternity past that he was dying for me. In that sense, we are something special. But the truth is, everything I can muster is nothing more than dirty rags before God. And because of that, I am not the guy 
that, that, you know, even David was called, what, man after God's own heart. And yet we look at his lifestyle, some of the choices that he made, particularly as he got a little bit older, and he made some really bad choices. And God, even though he was a man after God's own heart, we all recognize that God had to send a preacher into his house and say, look, you did something wrong, right? So God's word doesn't always make you feel better. And if you hear a preacher that preaches nothing but you, you're you okay, that preacher is a false teacher. I'm just telling you straight up. Because that's not what God's word is designed to do. God's word is designed to help us look more like Christ, look less like we do today. That means that something's got to be cut doesn't always make you feel better. All That's right? why those churches aren't quiet like ours was Sunday, because those were are being stepped on in the good ones, when they're doing the good service and everything's so good and healthy and lovely and wonderful. And uh, <laughs> they don't get quiet. Yes, ma'am. That was quiet. <laughs> 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 so, uh, <laughs> that was a, uh, That was one of those sermons. Yeah, that was one of those. Uh, so here's the thing. The gift of discernment, he says, uh, may be defined as a God-given ability to discern between the things of God and the things of Satan for the protection of believers of God's truth. That is, the gift of discernment is in the church so that the person who has this gift can protect the truth in the church. Comments or questions? Uh, on the, the things, the... I guess the weaknesses or those sorts of points there. Uh, there are a couple of scriptural principles that help with some of that. One of those being from the very example that you gave of Eve, the, the adding to. Mm -hmm. One of the things we have to realize is that we're not going to improve upon God's design or his plan Absolutely. by avoiding all evil. That's, that's one right. of the mistakes people get into. Yes, we're told to flee temptation, to flee immorality, but you're not going to be able to completely isolate or avoid it while you reside in this world. Right. Right. And then, like I said, Sonny, the source was within you. So right, right. There's no way you're going to. Right. And then, number two, I think Jesus gives us the prime example to how to partially avoid that idea of being like a heresy hunter because the heresy hunter or the witch hunt sort of thing implies that you're not only a judge, but you're also jury and executioner. Absolutely. And Jesus gives us a prime example in the parable of the tares and the wheat. What happens? You have a servant. He goes out. He sees, oh, somebody's sown nasty weeds up in the midst of your crop here. You want me to root them up? And he's like, no. Wait until the harvest. It'll all be revealed and taken care of then. And so... He instructs them, beware that, yeah, this is going on, but it's not your job to go and uproot that out right. of place. That's true. That's a good thing. That's true. That's true. Any other right. comments? Well, in case any of you are heresy hunters here, I need to... I need to clarify something I just said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when I was talking about... Uh, Solomon having this sermon, and I said the Holy Spirit, understand the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit during the Old Testament was different than it was in the New Testament, okay? It come and went for specific purposes. Do I feel that it was given to Solomon so that he would have that discernment? Yes, I do. But I didn't want anyone to think, oh, Brother Joseph just said the Holy Spirit was poured out on people in the Old Testament like it was in the New Testament. That's not what I was trying to say, so... If you're a heresy hunter, there you go. I just clarified. Oh, I just want to that out. Yeah, I'm really sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I know some of you are already ready to jump on me as soon as we said amen. But uh, I reckon I will say that. But anyhow, uh, this is a very much, I, I need to give, like I said, that so often people don't want to use it. But uh, like John said, it's important not necessarily for you to point it out and remove them from whatever position they're in. That's up to God to do that. Okay, but it is very, very important that we, we know the truth, uh, we discern the truth, we let people know the truth, but you know, the executioner and all this kind of stuff, you're right. That's up to God in that case, okay? I believe. But, all right, no other 
Next week, we'll talk about singleness as a gift. Hey, and hopefully, we won't have anybody that's not now single experiencing that gift later. So. <laughs> we'll talk about singleness next week. Okay, we're going to close before it gets out of hand. Yeah. All right, no other questions. All right, well, um, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thanks for all of you that are joining us.